This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. He helps us pan for the gold inside ourselves. You need to have grit. I mean, a lot of this is grit. I feel like I've been made a better lawyer. They're talking about something that's real to them. You have to be really careful not to be Goliath. They saved a bunch of lives and changed society forever. But let's just begin the conversation. Welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation, your source for guidance to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your practice. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Welcome to the very first episode of Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope that you enjoy this podcast. Before we get started with our first guest, Josh Carton, I just want to talk a minute about why I'm doing this. Last year, I got into podcasts and started finding different things to listen to, but I couldn't really find anything that spoke to me as a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer. I mean, there's... A couple other legal-related podcasts, but, you know, what I'm looking for is something that's going to help me try civil cases better, that's going to help me run my law practice in a way that lets me have a life but still get cases worked up right and get everything done, and how to market my practice. And since I couldn't find exactly what I was looking for, I thought, well, maybe I can make one myself. And so I reached out to some fairly high-profile figures in the industry, and surprisingly, they agreed to be interviewed. So here we are, and... I hope you enjoy it. I hope that you learn as much from listening as I've done from doing these interviews. So our very first guest is Josh Carton. Uh, Josh is an extraordinary trial consultant. He works with lawyers all over the country. He actually is not a lawyer. He comes from the theater background. But what he does is he teaches lawyers to communicate through our voice, through our eyes, through our hands. Really one of the best people in the world at learning to speak to and get a jury to feel what you want to feel and what you feel about a case. So I'm really excited to have been able to interview Josh. He's actually just published a book with David Ball, Theater and Trial. I hope you learned half as much from listening as I did from interviewing him. Josh, how are you doing today? Well, I've spent the day with you and uh, the attorneys in your firm, so I'm uh, enriched. Well, thank you. Inspired. Grateful. I appreciate that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> For people that might not know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about you know who are you and what do you do? I have no idea who I am. <laughs> it's funny, they always used to say, you know, you have to know who you are. Um, and I would think, yeah, but which one? being still connected with, quote, being a real person, uh, like a juror, is valuable. I think my goal is that when the lawyer or the lawyer's witness leaves that stand or the courtroom, they feel that what was in their heart they knew how to speak. So it's not a question of telling anybody what to say, but um, as an actor, I used to have such extreme stage fright, so I understand how petrified you can get. So that when you're done, you can turn it over to the jury and feel, okay, anything that I brought, all the kindling, it's been used up. And I can now, there's nothing about, oh, I wish I'd known how to. I think that's what my goal is. I do. Does that sound too esoteric and abstract? Um, well, as someone that's worked with you, uh, I understand it. Uh, and I think how I would describe your work has changed over the years. When I first met you, I would have said that you were someone that teaches someone how to do eye contact and use body language and how to do voice inflection and you know better communicate with people. And that's all part of what you do. But I think that once I kind of got past the basic skills and got willing to be more vulnerable and expose myself and not have to, have to perform and not have to be the star in the room as much, uh, not you know get over the ego things, you know, I think you were kind of like a guide to discover what's really going on, what's the inner voice, how do I communicate with someone, how do I realize I don't have the power to make a juror do what I want them to do. So how do I tell a story in a way that communicates to them 
in a way that would make them want to do what I would like them to do, if that makes any sense. Well, it makes sense to me. Um, I don't think you can. Pres- I don't think you can persuade anybody to do anything. Now you've just published a book. Uh, just now, right now, yeah, in, I, I, two I, minutes in answer to your question, right? Well, I mean, in the I'm last, it's come you. out in the last week. Yeah. Uh, by the time this gets actually yeah. on the internet, this will, it will have been out for a month or two, but. Uh, I just finished reading it last night. Uh, really the whole quickly. thing? Yeah. Wow. I read quickly. I was up till two in the morning, but it was engaging. And I mean, for me, it's so much a, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with you over the last 20 years. And then to read you describe what I've seen you do was just a really interesting uh, experience. You know, I'm really troubled that when you ask me these questions, that what comes across is fragmentary impressionistic responses not the actual exercises that we do to achieve those goals um and that's why it took me a long time to write it because i didn't know how to put it into language and it exists because david ball said you have to and invited me to do it for which i'm completely grateful i was gonna say is that what inspired because you've i'm sure You've been doing this and been at the top of your game. I mean, you're the, as far as I'm concerned, you're the man on this, in this field of communicating better uh, with jurors, uh, communicating in, in general. Uh, I'm sure you've had other opportunities. What is it that inspired you to write it now? Well, um, there was a period a few, some years ago, where people were putting out CLE workbooks, videos and workbooks. And I could just imagine people sitting, watching, filling in a workbook, getting CLE, but never actually getting up and doing it. It's a live, physical event. It's not an intellectual exercise. And David was doing... He, he said, there are a lot of people who are making a lot of money off what you've created. And you have to write this stuff down. And I never knew how to do it because it happens live. It happens in the moment. It happens moment by moment depending on what the speaker's block is, what their intention is, what the case is. It's not one size fits all. But there are exercises that I created and that helped bring the person up out from under the training and result in a more effective communication. And so um, I tried because he asked. And then there was a very long gestation period to all this because he was going to be putting out a new edition of Theater Tips and Strategies, which is something, you know, what, 25 years ago? I read in galleys before David Ball was David Ball. And um, he said, we'll just, we'll include them. And I said, well, then just make it an appendix. And he said, no, he's very generous, a co-author. So I thought, well, these two halves have to work together. I'll do an encyclopedic concordance (laughs) where I'll key all the exercises to what he's talking about. And he said, well, I'll just interview you. And so we did five days of of, of interview, and then they were transcribed, and I cut and edited and arranged those. And trial guides looked at it and said, well, it's very nice. But then you have to put them back together and make a single book. So then it became this thing of how do we differentiate the two voices, how to make sure that the book has a forward uh, momentum, even going to the dialogue of the two people. And so I'm very gratified to hear that you say it had the sound of real talking, because I think that is so many lawyers think of it as their monologue. And what they're looking for, what's so potent, is when they have a dialogue with a jury, even if the jury isn't talking, but the lawyer is in relationship to them. And if the relationship between the two of us came through, 
then that was a goal. Yeah, and it's probably a little different for me because I've had the pleasure of working with you. I've been able to work with David on a few cases, and you know, so I actually heard both of your voices uh, when I was. Re- I never hear someone's voice when I'm reading. I just I see words. I don't even hear the words when I read. Typically, I see them. I somehow process them. And- well, that was a real challenge too for trial guides because there were two. It had to be two different uh, fonts for each of us, and then there had to be a font for the neutral stuff. And so, and then there was a font for the transcripts of dialogue. It wasn't easy, and I'm so glad it works. I mean, there's so many people who, the way they've put things, whether they were directors or writers or actors, some of that language became something that spoke to me. And one of them was a a director and actress, Joan Darling. And she said that when you see a thoroughbred, they're having an experience of themselves that is the fullest possible experience of themselves that they could be having. And lawyers will get criticized, oh, you're in your head. Well, you have to be in your head a lot. There's a lot of head stuff to do. But when you are in live communication and you are communicating to a jury I think what they're seeing is a what they want to be seeing is a creature who isn't protecting him or herself but is entirely that it's it's consumatory their task to protect their client and thereby protect the juror who could be in the client's role, is using up everything that you have. So there's nothing being held in reserve, nothing watching, um, and I think n- nothing being faked. Um, and I think that's what lets people trust. The other thing is, and this also comes from acting, you have to have an objective. What are you trying to do? And it has to be a verb. Because um, I'm not trying to be a lawyer. You can't. The, and, and if you could, you'd be fungible with an infinite number of other lawyers. So it would have to be an active verb. That's to say it would be something you're trying to do that has an effect on someone else that isn't a form of the verb to be. And I thought, well, most of the time, most lawyers go in trying to achieve a negative objective. I'm trying to not bore the jury. I'm trying to not lose. I'm trying to not um, you know, embarrass myself. I'm trying to not piss off the judge. In there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't achieve a negative objective. I mean, I quit smoking successfully several times because each time I would be not having a cigarette. And the only way that you're done with not having a cigarette is by having the cigarette. You have to be wanting to do something that lets the negative behavior that you're trying to eliminate, that's incompatible with it. What can you be doing that while you're doing it, it's not possible to be smoking a cigarette? So... I thought, well, what's something? Because as I said, I have enormous stage fright. My fear threshold's very low. And my shame threshold is very low. So what's something that if I'm committed to doing allows me to get through anything? And I, I came to think, well, it's the verb to protect. That if I am gonna protect somebody else, and I I I deploy everything I have to that aim, I can get through a lot of self-consciousness, a lot of fear, a lot of self-criticism, because somebody else needs me. So in the end, I've come to feel that what we're doing when I go in as an advocate is I am protecting the jurors from this being done to them what's being done to my client. Is that coherent? It, it is, and it's part of an evolution. I was thinking that, you know, I've gone from 
trying to protect myself from yes. looking bad or being embarrassed or some or criticism to protecting my client uh, and being the champion for my client, which is still important, I think, to really, in the last couple of years, thanks in part to the work I've done with you, of viewing myself as I'm here to be the protector, the guide, the conduit of truth yeah. for this for this jury so that they can go and do their job, so they can go and, and, and do justice in the world and try to make the world a better place and use the power they have in a positive way. And it's just, it's so much more enjoyable to try a case now. <laughs> it really is because the last two trials I've had have been joy. They've, I've not had the headaches I used to have. It used to be I'd, I'd get out of the courtroom and I'd be exhausted and I'd be fine because of the adrenaline while I was in there and I'd have these horrible headaches and then I'd eat real bad afterwards, you know, just pig out at night. Uh, but it's just kind of what I do when I get when I get stressed. It's one of my bad habits I'm working on overcoming. Well, somebody once said to me, when do you eat? And I said, in the dark, alone. <laughs> Um, well, I would eat in the dark and the light and the twilight. I would, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my problem. But the uh, but when you don't see it as being about you, uh, when you see your goal as being a guide uh, rather than being trying to be the hero and being the one that's going to force this jury to do what you want them to do or somehow you're going to be so suave and persuasive that they're going to be hypnotized by you or something. When you take that pressure off yourself and just say, I'm going to, I'm going to try to discover the truth and share it with these people and make them understand how they can make the world a better place. And then it's up to them. And just, it's more fun. I've been more successful. Uh, but it's just been, you know, my last trial, Mallory Peacock, one of the lawyers that works with me, says, I can't believe you're so relaxed. You're not stressed. You're not nervous. You're, you know, you're, you're talking normally. Uh, now, a lot of that, I've done a lot of work to try to do that, but... Uh, it is such a more enjoyable experience, and because of that, I'm, I'm so much more real and relatable with the jury. Whereas before, I was much more theatrical. Uh, you know, I would probably be more in action, have even more yelling, or you know, more even more animated. Although I'm I'm still animated, uh, but it wasn't as real. It was more of an act. Whereas now, it's just I'm more relaxed. It's just well, I'm learning to be me, and you've helped me a lot with that, and I appreciate it. Well, I think one of the costs of it being an act is that you are ashamed of it and you force yourself to do it. And maybe you don't know that there's an alternative. There is. But there's this, um, you're dragging this self-consciousness with you because there, there's a kind of uh, metallic shrill and you know it. Yeah. And also, I think it has something, you know, the what lawyers put on themselves. I and mean, we have such, you know, I've unfortunately lost several friends to suicide. Uh, I've seen, you know, the, the drugs, the alcohol, the other ways people act out, you know, whether it's adultery, overeating, risky behavior, uh, buying a bunch of crazy expensive stuff, whatever it is people do to deal with their unhappiness. Uh, I think a it's so common in our profession. And, you know, part of it is I think it's because we take on all this pain, all this horror that we see, and we do hold ourselves responsible. And when you hold it all in, it's almost you're not as effective at doing anything about it. It's, it's You almost have to let it go and just trust the jury. Realize I don't have the power. I, I cannot win my case. I don't have the power to make anybody do anything. So I'm just going to have to learn to trust people and to bring them the truth and, and just have faith in them to do the right thing. And, and then it relieves so much stress. And then because you're not all stressed out, they seem to be more likely to do it. So here's a question uh, that I think a lot of people are struggling with. Say about bringing them the truth. And for a lot of us, that was a lighthouse beacon of... Um, it was the you know like the watchword of our faith that it was a search for the truth and the more truthful you were and the more unafraid of revealing the truth whether it's about your own flaws or your clients flaws the more vulnerable and in this country right now there's a lot of confusion 
about the truth, which truth, alternate facts, fake news. Um, I was very grateful that in all the small group work that I was doing in the months after the 2016 election, people still seem to feel that they wanted the truth brought to them and that it would distress them if they felt people were keeping it from them. But for a lot of people who go into court now, there's some real confusion about it. Um, I hope it's okay to ask you this. It is. I think it is an issue because politically people want to believe whatever reinforces their pre-existing belief. Yeah. Uh, and so you see people that will, you know, there'll be an, an accusation against someone on the other team. And no matter how flimsy the accusation, they take it as gospel when it's first made. And yet if it's someone on their team, it doesn't matter how credible and how many people it's, well, they're just trying to bring this person down. Or it was a long time ago. Or it's excusable. Uh, and I think that at least in trial work, you know, you people seem to take it a little more seriously for some reason. And, and uh, you know, I think if we don't make the mistake of going in there and challenging their well-held beliefs. I mean, I practice in Texas. If, if I go in there and, and say Fox News is fake news, uh, or if I go to San Francisco and call CNN the Communist News Network, um, I'm probably going to have people shut off on me right away. Uh, and so I, I kind of just don't get into that kind of stuff and, and frankly for my own peace of mind I've become a lot less political I've watched the lose news a lot less than I ever did before um, because it, I have a limited amount of energy every day and I'm going to choose to try to spend it on something that I can actually do something with and do something about and uh, the other things I've been I've gotten to too deep into politics. I've gotten to know people too well on both sides of the aisle, and the disenchantment when you see how it all really works yeah. can be so deep that it's really hard to fight for one side or the other because you don't really believe that there's that big of a difference sometimes. The uh, but I do find the jurors still take their role very seriously. Absolutely. And you know. Well, that's what I meant. That yeah. that um, people still want to believe that there is uh, you know Brecht says um, something about beware the power of goodness <laughs> um, and Carl Bettinger talked about that in his book about the desire to do something good and I'm actually seeing uh, not only in my own cases but just looking at verdicts around Texas, which is a you know, pretty conservative part of the country. And yet... There's an uptick in verdicts. And wasn't Texas the first place where um, eyewitness testimony was being reevaluated? Do you know about that? I, I don't, and I apologize. I, I, no, no, it's, <laughs> I, it's okay. But it was uh, because we know how... Um, I mean, isn't that that most of the wrongful convictions, I don't know, is that accurate? Uh, they don't have to do, like, with the, it gets solved by DNA, and that the main thing is mistaken eyewitness testimony. Um, yeah, people unfortunately put a lot more stock into eyewitness testimony. I know I've, I've personally been involved in, in two incidents, one where I was actually the person that was... A, assaulted in one where I was in a place when oh, no. there were people being shot. And and I will honestly tell you that I can replay very vivid pictures in my mind about what happened. And I guarantee you, if you had a video of either event, what vividly is in my mind is not what happened. Mm -hmm. Because the day afterwards, I didn't have these vivid pictures in my mind. It's just after reliving them over and over again, you create this picture in your mind. But it's not really what happened. And it's you know something I've seen... It's a, I'm going to get more esoteric, so hopefully our 
listeners, so uh, bear with us. But uh, psychodrama, the, the, the trial lawyers college uh, often uses psychodrama. And, and I know lawyers that believe that what happens in a psychodramatic session is the truth and the actual, you know, every little detail that comes out is what really happened. And there's a way of rediscovering, you know, almost like a, a hypnosis or a past life regression or something where you're, you're finding out what happened, although the person couldn't remember until they put into action. And I think there's a, I think you discover the greater truth of the story and what someone remembers. It helps teach someone to learn their story and, and find how to tell it better and more persuasively. But I think what you discover is what they believe happened and, and what they're reconstructing as what happened. I don't know that it would necessarily be the same as if you had a camera watching it. When um, I was little, I, I mean, there's a classic exchange on the playground I remember about, is so, is not, is so, is not, is so, is not. And even then, I was struck by how deep the need to be right where does that come from? Why is it so um, unsettling to say, uh, oh, I was wrong about that, wasn't I? Uh, before my father uh, died, I remember he was in the hospital, and he said uh, to me, looking back on... Uh, his sternnesses and his rages and his, he said, a lot of what uh, was so important to me, it wasn't really important, was it? And I was just so touched by that. Um, is it possible to have that not <laughs> in the hospital <laughs> facing your mortality? But it, it the... Um, the need to be right. I know that's something I've struggled with in my life. Uh, if you, you know, actually when you first met me, I had a lot more of a need to be right. Um, and I would argue with people a lot more than I argue now. I mean, it was that you still enjoy when I was younger debating and arguing with people. Whereas now, when I went home and someone wants to argue with me, I'm saying I'm a, I'm a I'm a professional at this, so if I'm not getting paid, I don't want to argue. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I really don't argue as a lawyer. That's not what I actually do, because I don't sit there and go back and forth with somebody. And uh, But there is a lot of ego in being right, a lot of, you know, if I'm wrong, then I'm vulnerable. If I'm wrong about this, I can be wrong about other things. Then who know, you know, my foundation, if you don't have a good foundation of who you are, and, a lot of, I guess, self-examination, it, it can be painful not to be right about things. And I think that's why people hold on. And I think it goes back to the whole fake news thing. I mean, you, you want to believe something so bad. Because uh, if you look at, like, the Russians played both sides, it looks like. If you look at the Facebook ads they were putting, they were putting as many crazy things out there about the Republicans as they were about the Democrats. They, they, I think they ran more ads against the Democrats. Uh, and I think that was probably more of a, you know, Donald Trump would be more chaotic for America, which was probably true, uh, than Hillary Clinton would be. Uh, but, you know, both sides would believe things that looks now are just foreign propaganda because they agreed with it and it should, they, they believed something and this was proof that I'm right and they wanted to be right so bad that they would overlook the source of, of it. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately I think that happens in trial work too. I think. You know, I, I've seen it in focus groups. I, I don't, you know, have the pleasure of watching real jury deliberations. But we do a lot of focus groups, and you'll see somebody once they've latched on to, I believe this. This is what happened. They will twist things around, ignore evidence to the contrary, do everything they can to try to hold on to that position that, that they're right. Uh, well, supposedly, once you connect to a story, then uh, something that contradicts it, you just toss out because it doesn't fit the story that, that, that you have. Um, and something interesting, and, I, and we'll get to the book in a little bit, but I, was, I just finished reading uh, your new book and, uh, that you co-wrote with uh, the David Ball and Artemis Malakpour, who I admire a lot, also had some comments in the book. And one thing I noticed that I think came from her is that, you know, I con we work a lot on eye contact. I've worked a lot on eye contact with you starting sure. in 
97, and it is so important, you know, to make a human connection with the juror. But she's finding that if you're making eye contact with somebody who emphatically disagrees with you, uh, it's almost like you're look, staring someone in the eye right. and challenging right. them. It's not a staring uh, contest. I mean, this whole thing about making eye contact, it's an interesting verb. It's like doing lunch. Um, you don't really make eye contact. I mean, maybe that's what it's seen or described as afterwards. Um, but I, for me, it's about being really present with the person that you're talking to. And what did I once hear that um, the eyes, when you're, I think maybe Michael Leeserman talked about this, that it's the brain that, um, see, how did this go? Something about what you're really doing is you're seeing into the brain. I don't know. But it, the idea of making eye contact, I think of it as you're letting somebody see into you and that you're not hiding anywhere. You're not taking refuge in any hidden corners. You're letting them see into you if they want to. And then if they don't want to, I'm thinking about a jury, you know, the, there's somebody who doesn't want to be in eye to eye contact. There's, uh, then it's not about I have to chase you and force you. And then, of course, there's cultures where direct eye contact is considered insolent or assaultive or challenging. Um, and so it has to be earned. I, I mean, it's about being available to whatever's needed to protect who you're there to protect. And if you have to be seen to do it, if, if you have to struggle to find language, if you have to uh, say, I was wrong. Um, you know, today, one, one of the uh, women attorneys was worried that the emotion could make her seem weak. And it's such a harrowing concern. And a part of me, it hurts that somebody has to be worried that evidence of their feeling for other people is going to be used against them and they're going to be demeaned as weak. I don't like that. <laughs> I agree, and actually it's it's funny because I hear, you know, having a more great female trial lawyers is something that I've, is important to me and it's something at my firm I'm trying to promote. Uh, but as a 6'4", 200-something pound male, my biggest fear in the courtroom is a five foot two female and uh who is not showboating who is just genuine and herself and some of my least satisfying verdicts have come uh again i mean i remember i tried a case uh, against a she's Lindsay getta now she was Lindsay lawrence at the time at lawyer in mcallen and i had a slam dunk case. I was at the best venue in the state. My client stopped at a red light. An 18-wheeler comes and rear-ends him. He gets surgery. And I was young and cocky and thought I was going to knock this thing out of the park. And she was young and vulnerable and just dressed normal, talked normal. And she won that case. I got nothing. Uh, she beat me. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've Tried several cases against her, and you know I've, I've won some, but I've never like knocked it out of the park because she's never going to get that jury mad. And you know I want to be David, not Goliath. And when you're a man who's six four and you're fighting against a woman who's five two, you have to be really careful not to be Goliath because that's what you look like. Uh, and so I think that female lawyers, if they will not try to put on armor and not try to act tougher than you know, try to act extra tough or try to over, try to be something other than who they are, just like male lawyers need to be just who they are. 
uh, I think they have a great power. Of course. And uh, a power that, you know, that I have to, you know, I think I have to work extra hard on not because of my physicality. Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, I can very easily look like I am picking up or beating up on some witness or some, you know, just the way I stand next to somebody. When You have to be aware of the physicality. And so I think it's, you know, and, and some things it gives you confidence to be a big person uh, but on, on others I think you have to be very self-aware and I think that uh, it all comes down to if you just put down all your BS and start acting real it all works out but I think that you know the fear of showing emotion is the exact opposite fear that you should have I think the the, the fear you should have is the, the fear of not letting your true self out because when you let your true self out people relate to it Fanny Bryce said um, that uh, the problem with putting on a, a mask, a persona, is is that eventually it's going to slip, and then where are you? <laughs> um, well, there's a reason they stopped using masks in theater. I mean, the Greeks, everyone had a mask. They don't do that anymore. Well, they do actually in, you know, uh, several theaters, like Bali and places okay. like uh, the mass. But it's a way not of hiding, but of releasing. I remember um, watching some performances where some kids were in costume and kids who were really... So, I mean, but I mean like, you know, a lion costume, a full body suit. Right. And um, this kid who was always the awkward, nerdy one was uh, doing cartwheels down the financial district in San Francisco <laughs> in this suit. It, re it gave you permission yeah. to release um, all your eccentricities and things because it wasn't you. So what so, are what are our lawyer costumes that we wear? Because I know I for one don't wear a a coat and tie to the office, and I don't wear a coat and tie when I'm lounging around the house talking to my kids. I mean, what are our lawyer costumes releases to do? So uh, years ago, I'm watching this National Geographic um, special, um, and it's there was a book called Dress for Success, and I'd never read it, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I'd heard what it was about, but what these guys were saying. And so I was following these young professional men who were going into Bloomingdale's or something. And there was a guy from Panama who had this beautiful mahogany skin. And the sales lady showed him a uh, lighter, like a tan khaki suit, summer suit. And uh, he said, no, I, I can't wear that because, um, oh, I agree, it looks better with my coloring, but given that white males wear the blue and the black, I'm, I, I need to wear that to show that I can compete. Oi, um, if I could have thrown the TV across <laughs> the room. And I thought, this is not the world I want to... Uh, co-create yeah. and um, it hurt too because here he was saying I'm drawn to this this is what I know aesthetically works better for me this is my own personal preference but I'm not allowed because I have to show that I can pass um, So I know, I mean, uh, I'm surprised, actually. I've worked with some law firms that are uh, intellectually really forward-thinking, and they're absolutely vehement that they have to wear black suits and navy suits in the courtroom, and they'll say the judges sometimes require it, um, that there are still courtrooms where a judge will require a woman to wear a skirt. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't understand quite how that's allowed, but... Yeah, I saw that when I first practiced. I knew of some judges that required women to wear skirts. Um, I 
don't know how many of them there still are, and uh, I'm hoping there aren't many. And uh, I think women should be free to wear skirts if they want to, but my gosh, I don't think that they should be forced. Should men be able to wear skirts, kilts? Makes them happy. <laughs> I was going to say, right. Uh, you know, as right. a... As an advocate uh, in our current jury pool, are you running a risk of harming your client because right. a juror is going right. to react negatively? Yeah, but I mean, it's know. always like a fine yeah. balance, isn't it? It's a high wire act. How much are you compromising what you want to stand for because it you have to choose your battles and it will turn into... And it'll distract from what you're there for. And if you take on the responsibility of somebody else's freedom um, in either way in the courtroom as an advocate, then, um, as you say, it's not about you. So to turn it into it being about you at the cost of... I mean, this brings up this thing that you were saying about ego, the trialer has to have an extraordinarily large ego. You have to be able to tent in the firmament of that courtroom. On the other hand, be ruthlessly humble when somebody says um, something that's going to sound critical. And, you know, uh, uh, Eric Oliver said that's one of the three marks of maturity uh, that. Um, what were, how did that go? One that you defer, you can defer instant gratification. Well, count me out. <laughs> the other is that you would do something even if you thought your mother would think it was good for you, which I loved. And the third was that when somebody's going to tell you something that you think is going to be critical, your first response is, "Tell me more." Yeah, um, we'll turn to that. I, I mean, to me. I'm not a fashion person anyway. I don't put a whole lot of thought. Uh, I'll be honest. I let my wife choose a lot of my clothing. Uh, and to me, a what I wear in a courtroom, uh, especially in front of a jury, is I feel like I'm an like an actor that needs to be costumed. I'm, I'm going. I need to wear what is going to be the best for the part that I'm there to play. I need right. to be there to wh whatever is going to not get in the way of me communicating with the jury or maybe even me be me, me more accepting so what do you think you know what advice do you give on co costuming or dressing for, for trial you know there are no absolutes in that if you're going up against corporate suits and at the other table there are Ferragamo loafers and uh, Hugo Boss blackness and blues um, there's wisdom in having a tweed sports coat and a knit tie. Um, but again, it's like I don't want to be talking authoritatively about outfits because if you're really doing your work, nobody's looking at it anyway, they're looking into your eyes. And so I'm not being cranky about it, and I understand you have to ask, but... Um, I didn't have to ask. I was just curious. No, I mean, one has <laughs> yeah. to ask. Um, when I remember when I would s start working with lawyer groups, um, if it was a week-long program on the first night, I would always wear something in blues and blacks to establish my integrity. And, the, and then the next day, we would move into the browns, and now I haven't worn a necktie in a very long time. But I'm not doing what the lawyer has to do, where I'd wear a necktie. Um, what do you wear? Uh, I generally... Again, I'm a 6'4", 200 and something pound male, so I, I generally do not wear a suit. I generally wear khakis, a shirt, a tie, and a earth tone jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, I sometimes will wear a navy blue blazer, uh, but that's usually a laundry issue, not a, uh, <laughs> a I, fashion I prefer the, issue. Uh, I prefer the earth tone jacket. 
And, and my thought is just you not prefer a wet jacket, an earth tone, like a brown, uh-huh. tan. I, I'm not really good at describing colors. I don't have the vocabulary for it, but you know, brownish, tannish types of colors. Uh, and to me, I just I don't want to look. I've been a corporate lawyer. I don't want to be one. I don't want to look like the big, powerful alpha male. I don't want to look like the lawyer on TV and the TV ad promising you a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, I want to look off code. Uh, I just don't want to look you know, respectable. I dress decent. Because I, I think if you're too sloppy, that's a distraction, too. Right. Um, I've learned to do protein shakes for lunch so I don't come back with food spilled on my tie and shirt. Because, again, it's a distraction. It's not just that it looks bad, but it... If a jury is looking at my food stains, they might not be paying as much attention to me. Uh, so I try to, like I said, just be look decent, uh, but not anything too expensive, too flamboyant. Uh, and I know people that get away with it otherwise. Uh, yes, people who say my credibility in front of that jury is based on the Rolex watch. Um that bothers me. And, and, but then again, I'm not a person that feels comfortable. My my father gave me his Rolex watch, and it was a big emotional deal because it's one he'd had for years and years, uh, about 10 years ago. And I, uh, it means a lot to me. Uh, I still have it. I will never give it away. But I think I've worn it twice. In, I mean, like, like two days. Because uh, I don't feel comfortable wearing a Rolex watch. And it's not that I can't afford a Rolex watch. Do you wear a wristwatch? I occasionally wear a, a Garmin wristwatch because it tracks my steps and I can use it when I run. But uh-huh. no, I'm not really a, a watch person. For years, my mother would say, I don't understand how you exist without a watch. And um, there was just something about, you know, I just have this one body. And it was not the one I requested, but here mm-hmm. it is. And strapping a timepiece on one of my wrists just felt like um no <laughs> i don't want that so and i've never missed a plane so but you know like i said I, and i'm not criticizing people to do but I, no? I i i do think there is a a danger to you know looking like the slick lawyer yeah uh, it's just that one person's slick lawyer is another person's successful lawyer and one person's um, uh, architect college professor is another person's inappropriate. And um, I mean, I'm with you. If I had my druthers, it's something that has texture, something that doesn't bespeak corporate power uh, or protecting it. And that's my wedge. That's my, my the, the aperture through which I see things. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. I've really enjoyed our conversation, and I, I look forward to working with you more in the future. Yes, more soon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our interview with Josh Carton. As you could probably tell, I really like talking to someone I've known for that long and, and really learned about how and why he does some of the exercises we've been doing the last 20 years. If you want to learn more about what Josh does, I really recommend you buy his book, Theater and Trial, that he wrote with David Ball. Uh, or work with him on a case or go to a trial lawyer's college workshop. He's you know, presenting at many of those and get the first-hand experience because Josh will make you a better lawyer. I hope you come back for our next episode. We have Joe Freed, a nationally renowned trucking lawyer, who's going to talk about not only being a trucking lawyer, but how to hyper-specialize, how to become really good in one area, how he did it and how you can do it too. We look forward to talking with you again soon as we continue to explore powerful insights from our amazing hosts and remarkable guests here on Trial Lawyer Nation. Until then, please be sure to subscribe and review this podcast on iTunes or your favorite listening app so we can continue to reach more listeners. Visit us at www.triallawyernation.com to send us a message, listen to previous podcasts, or learn more about Michael Cowan and our guests. 
This podcast has been hosted by Michael Callen and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.